All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, today I'm in this 2015 Mini Cooper SD. This is the third generation new Mini, and it's known as the F55. It was available from 2014 onwards. They were available with many different engines, but the one we're talking about today is the two-litre four-cylinder 170 brake horsepower turbo diesel. This reminds me very much of the two-litre turbo diesel Audi A1, which, although it's a dirty dirt burner, it feels like a hot hatch. It's got plenty of get up and go. You might think that a diesel can't be a hot hatch, but I'd argue that it can. This is a hot hatch that'll do 45 miles per gallon and only cost 30 pounds a year to tax. You can see the appeal, can't you? Styling wise, this third generation new Mini is bigger than its predecessor, which in turn was bigger than its predecessor too. They seem to get bigger with every generation. The Mini timeline is almost like a reverse Russian doll. I imagine by the time they get round to the 11th generation in 2083, it'll be the size of a Hummer H2. Anyway, the fact that this is 98mm longer and 44mm wider than the previous model means you get a bit more interior space, which, let's be honest, it desperately needed. It also means it has a larger boot at 211 litres. It still isn't what you'd call spacious, but it's just that little bit easier to live with. They also made a convertible version and a five-door version, which, to be honest, isn't very mini at all. It's quite a big car, that. It's also not particularly attractive. The proportions are just a bit off. I suppose it makes sense that they offered a five-door. I guess they were trying to mop up sales that they were previously missing because they only offered it as a three-door. Styling-wise, I think this three-door hatch is the best-looking version. I think it looks awesome. It's instantly recognisable as a Mini. There's no denying its heritage or its DNA. No paternity test required here. What's always been the case with the new Mini is that it has a premium look and feel to it, which a lot of small city cars just don't have. Yes, it's a little car, but it doesn't look or feel cheap. Actually, thinking about it, that's because it's not cheap. It's actually quite expensive, but I'll get onto that later. In my opinion, the styling works on this still, but it does look a little bit bloated. I don't think it's as pretty as the previous R50 or R56. Right, we are just about to get on the bypass, and I'm going to do a little performance test for you to show you how brisk this car is. So, foot to the floor. That two-litre turbo diesel engine does pin you into your seat. And before you know it, I've already got three points. What surprised me straight away with this car, you'll probably disagree because one, my microphone's quite sensitive, and two, it's quite a windy day, but there's not an awful lot of road or wind noise. Moving inside the new Mini is where the biggest improvements lie. Everything is that bit better than the previous models. For a start, it doesn't feel as though you're in a small car. It doesn't feel cramped. The windscreen is a good distance away from you. The visibility is excellent. I've got a glass roof, so it's nice and bright and airy. They've used every design trick in the book to make this car feel bigger than it actually is. And straight away you'll notice that everything feels high quality. Every single thing that you touch, press or look at feels high end. This JCW steering wheel, for example, is lovely. Everything feels durable. If you either had or spent any time in a previous generation Mini, from the moment you get in this, it'll all feel quite comfortable because it's generally the same theme, although everything's that little bit better. The round speeder in the centre is now gone, and that now houses the infotainment screen, and that's where you'll find your sat-nav, your radio controls, your settings, all that sort of stuff. Annoyingly though, and confusingly, it isn't touchscreen, which is weird because everything's within reach. No, instead, you control it from this rotary iDrive system down here, which is a little bit fiddly to operate. It's all a bit unnecessarily complicated. Still, with enough time and enough patience, you might eventually figure it out. I just think it would have made much more sense as a touchscreen system. Anyway, who am I? This model's fitted with a Harman Kardon stereo, which is excellent. The quality is up there. It's nice and bassy. It's a good system. If you think about buying one of these, I'd urge you to go for a high-spec model. Something with a chilli pack. It makes owning one of these a much nicer proposition. Take this model, for example. I've got a full leather interior with heated seats, head-up display, sat-nav, DAB, Harman Kardon stereo, pan roof, it's as well equipped as any luxury car I've been in. It's an upmarket car, parceled in a small package. It's impressive. This is a rare car because it treads that thin line between being both well-built and sensible, but also quirky and fun. That rarely happens. Usually a car's one thing or the other. Very rare is it both. This one is. I love all the switches and buttons. They made everything interesting. Although this automatic gear lever is a bit strange. It looks like my Scotty Cameron putter. I also love that you get a proper armrest. Not many small cars come with that. I know this is primarily a city car, but it is perfectly comfortable enough to do plenty of miles in. You look through your rear view mirror and the back windscreen feels like it's a mile away, and yet you look over your shoulder and it's right there. It's all very clever. You can appreciate the engineering gone into it. 
Under the bonnet, there are lots of different engines to choose from. There are several three cylinders, including a small 1.2, which would be ideal for a first time driver. Then you've got the Cooper and the Cooper D, which come with a 1.5 litre three cylinder, or you've got the Cooper S and the Cooper SD. Now, they're the ones I'd spend my own money on. They're both proper four cylinders, and they're properly quick. This Cooper SD model makes 170 horsepower, which, all right, nowadays doesn't sound like a lot, but you've got to remember this car only weighs 1600 kilos. So it's capable of doing 0 to 60 in only seven seconds. It does feel brisk. One of the best things about this car though is the handling. It is superb. It feels as though you are glued to the road. No matter how fast you're going in it, it feels as though you're driving over fresh tar. It just gives you the utmost confidence to drive it like a hooligan. There's also a sport mode. Let's see if that makes any difference at all. It even sounds pretty good for a diesel. I'm currently sat behind a 2018 Cooper S and they are a good looking car. They're not a small car anymore, granted, but they are good looking. What's more, the steering is so precise. It handles as though it's on rails. It's very impressive, this. But most of all, it just feels, feels fun. It doesn't feel boring and Germanic. The other good thing about the steering is it isn't as heavy as previous models. So this isn't a chore to use around town. In minis of old, you need to be a professional shot putter to do a three point turn. But in this, not so. You could either go with a manual or an automatic like this. Now that's all down to personal choice, but personally, I'd go with an auto. Let's be honest, most manuals are a chore. Selecting reverse gear, for example, in a BMW or a Mini, usually leads you to having a dislocated shoulder. And this auto does a great job. You can even knock it over into sport mode and then change the gear manually using these paddles. The changes are smooth, quick, seamless. You couldn't really ask for better. The ride is a bit firm, but it's not as bad as previous generations, which were just downright irritating. I think as a second car or a city car, this would be perfect. This might just be me, but I prefer to be cosseted and comfortable in a car. So I wouldn't want to use something like this every single day. But that said, it's not bad. Saying that, perhaps I think it's not that bad because I was expecting it to be dreadful, and it really isn't dreadful. What always annoyed me about the new Mini from 2000, 2001 onwards, they're always too much like hard work. Everything was too heavy and too stiff. The door handles were heavy, the doors were heavy, the steering was heavy. It all just irritated me, but I'm pleased to say with this third generation, everything's that little bit easier, softer, lighter. It's a much easier car to live with. Actually, this is the first Mini I'd consider buying with my own money. That's how much I like it. What's funny is that from the moment you get in this, you just have a grin on your face. I can't even really explain to you why. It's just, it's just a fun car to drive and be in. So as always then, should you buy one? Should you buy a third generation Mini? Yeah, I would, genuinely, with my own money. It'd have to be a Cooper S though, or a Cooper SD. You know, I was thinking recently, I'd love to buy a small nippy car that I could use to just nip around town in. And I was thinking straight away, something like an M140i. I love those. But now having driven this, this has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works because I'd consider a Cooper S. Although I think, I think personally I'd go petrol. I just prefer petrol in general and it sounds better. The only negative thing to tell you really is price. They're quite expensive. They were dear new and they hold the values well. So they're still quite pricey used. Used prices here in the UK for a Cooper SD Auto start at around £12,000. For one like this, in a nice colour combination, nice spec with under 50,000 miles, expect to spend around 14 grand. So it is quite a lot of money, isn't it, for a seven, no, eight year old car. But remember, it is a quality item and depreciation ought to be minimal. Reliability wise, I've had a few of these third generation minis over the years and I can honestly say I've never had any serious issues. The two previous models, the R50 and the R56, I've had dozens of those over the years and they've all caused me serious, considerable heartache and wallet ache. I've had issues with engines, gearboxes, timing chains, turbos, water leaks, electronic issues. Issues with them overheating, issues with the sunroof, issues with the central locking. I'd be really reluctant to buy another one. But every third generation Mini I've had has been faultless. So I'd like to think that after 15 or 20 years of making the Mini, BMW have finally ironed out all the kinks. Well, I think that's about it. So thank you once again for watching, and thank you to the previous owner for getting in touch and selling me this car. I'm always on the lookout for nice stock, so if you've got something for sale, email me, matt at highpeakautos.com. That's Matt with two T's. So yeah, cheers guys, see you next time.